I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak at this uh, conference. I learned about this several years ago through uh, Dr. Stringer, my old college professor and friend, and I never thought that I would be speaking at this conference, but as you get older, doors open for you. <laughs> and uh, I just turned 66 last month, so I told my wife, it's all downhill from here. But uh, I don't consider myself to be a scholar, but I am a lifelong Bible student. I'm a student of the King James Bible. I read all the way through 31 times in my lifetime. So I've been saved for, since 1979, 44 years, and read the Bible all the way through 31 times on my 32nd reading right now. So I am a student of the Bible. And back in 2011, I wrote this book on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the King James, 100 Reasons for Using the King James Bible. And so it's available outside there on the uh, table, and uh, $10, and I think you'll get a lot of uh, good information there and a blessing from reading that book. But uh, I want to get into the message this afternoon. It's called Preserved Truth. Preserved Truth. When I trusted Jesus as my personal Savior in 1979, I was searching for truth and the purpose of my life. About five years later, after he got saved, he called me to preach. And I specifically remember saying to God, if you're calling me to preach, then direct me to the Bible you want me to use and help me to learn it well so I can teach it well. And then about 15 years after that, I took a course with Landmark Baptist College called Inspirational Scripture. In 1994, I read a book by Pastor Mickey Carter, Things That Are Different Are Not The Same, and it just got my appetite going for the Bible and understanding Scripture differences and texts like that. So God put me on a course because I told him I want to know which Bible is the correct one because I want to teach people the right things. And so in 35 years of ministry, like I said, I read the Bible from cover to cover, 31 times. I wanted a Bible that would communicate truth to all people, black, white, Latinos, on every continent, and destroy deception and lies in every culture. That was my goal. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 11, and verse 26, please. Acts 11 and verse 26. Now, this evening, Acts chapter 11, and verse 26, and let us all stand together for the reading of God's word, Acts 11 and verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians, first in Antioch. Heavenly Father, may you bless this meeting this evening. Give me the unction to speak your word clearly, communicate truth to the hearts of every person here, and give us a desire to know you better and to walk with you, not just with head knowledge, but also with practicality. Obeying your word and not just be hearers of it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. The traditional text was the Bible of the first century Christians, which predated the Reformation. The text of the King James Bible can be traced back to Antioch in Syria in the first century, which is a place where a strong New Testament church existed. There is a manuscript called the Peshitta, dates back to 150 A.D., and it agrees with the received text of the King James Bible. It was a place the disciples were first called Christians. The disciples at Antioch were in a missionary-sending church 
and a Christian training center with high regard for the written word of God. It is here that the true Bible text will be reverenced and kept pure down through the ages. The early Christians believed that they had to preserve, they had to preserve the word of God in the Old Testament manuscripts in their day. The apostles quoted extensively from the books of the law, Old Testament. They had it, and they believed it was the word of God. They regarded the historical accounts of the Old Testament to be literally true and in no way sought to explain them away. They want to explain away the miracles as the modernists tend to do. We see that in this church at Antioch, if you turn to Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now this man named Niger literally was Simeon the Black. He was a black African in this church at Antioch, ministering along with Saul and Barnabas, Jews, and Manan. This was a multi-ethnic, multicultural church, a New Testament church in every sense of the word. And the only reason why I bring up the name Niger for you is that the modernists, the uh, doubters of the Bible, they tend to want to direct black people in America away from New Testament Christianity into other forms of religion, other forms of worship. And so they say, well, you can't really believe the King James Bible because that's a bunch of white supremacists out there that's preaching that. That's the argument they use to try to get black folks away from the word of God. I'm just telling you. Okay? Don't stone the messenger. Right. So, because of this, it's important to understand that these men were in this church serving God together in harmony, but it says that they were teachers. And so, what were they teaching? What were they teaching? I will get back to that in just a, in just a little bit. What were they teaching? Now, the Lord Jesus, the Lord alluded to the account of creation, the flood of Noah days, he talked about it. He believed it actually happened. He alluded to the destruction of Sodom. By the way, there's a reason why it has no embassy today, no flags. The Lord Jesus alluded to the flood in the days of Noah, the judgment upon Sodom. He alluded to Moses to Jonah, to Daniel, Elijah, and Elisha. He believed that these people were actual real people that lived and walked on the face of the earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Apostle Paul all quoted from Isaiah the prophet. Luke mentions the Psalms on two occasions, and again in the book of Acts. Peter alludes to the book of Proverbs. James alludes to Job in his writings. So it is evident that the first century Christians had the Old Testament, and they consider Old Testament to be the preserved word of God. New Testament writers consider the Old Testament teachings to be authoritative, and the events described in them to be historical events. The church at Antioch was the place that God chose to preserve the true Bible text. The Bible was translated out of the original tongue into the Syriac language in the middle of the, 20th of the second century. This translation is known as the Peshitta, and it generally follows the Textus Receptus. Now, the scriptures, as I said, 
they had teachers in this church. So what were they teaching? Well, the scriptures that show them that the Gentiles could be saved because they were about to go on a mission trip. So this was a course in missiology that the Holy Spirit was conducting in this church with Barnabas and Saul and Simeon and the others. Isaiah 42 and verse 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49 and verse number 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes to Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. There's no doubt that those early Christians were studying the writings of Isaiah in the Old Testament because they're about to embark on a mission trip and they believed they had the word of God. There was no question. It's the Bible that Jesus used when he preached. So there could be no worldwide missionary movement if the early church did not believe in a preserved Bible. Think about that. No worldwide missionary movement without that belief. As far as psychological warfare is concerned, and that does that, exist. I was in the military for nearly nine years, and they do use something called psychological warfare against people. The media also uses it. It must be acknowledged that Satan wishes to accomplish two things in this age regarding the Holy Scriptures in the minds of people. Two things. Number one, Satan wishes to undermine the authority of the Word of God so that men and women will lose confidence in its precepts and turn wholesale to Luciferian philosophies, which will then completely destroy the culture, especially America, because we have so many gullible people over here, especially among the young. And uh, they need to be enlightened, and in some places they need to be spanked. But that's another sermon. So he wishes to undermine the authority of the Word of God in the minds of the people to turn them towards Luciferian teachings. Teachings that would please the flesh but not please God. He wants to turn the culture into a 100% pagan culture. We can see that now, today. I mean, who in the right mind would believe that we would have people telling kids with a straight face that a little boy can be a girl? Where did that come from? That is so obviously demonic. And if you don't stand against that stuff, you are not standing for Jesus. All right. That stuff is of the devil. And we as Christians have got to say that parents have the right to train their children with their values. Peter. Anyway, the second thing that Satan wants to do, he desires to cast doubts on the authenticity of the word of God. This is accomplished by the scholars who endorse Alexandrian family of manuscripts and place footnotes in study Bibles stating that the reason a given text was omitted from their version is due to the most ancient authorities. Do not include them because they are not the most ancient authorities. One of, one of the, uh, the standards I use to determine if a Bible is the right one is found in 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. And notice there it says, in that particular verse, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 
God was manifest in the flesh. Now, the NIV and others have, he appeared in a body. I'm sorry, I'm appearing in a body right now, but I'm not God. I mean, you are sitting there in a pew, you're in a body, but you're certainly not God. So, God, theos, is in the Greek manuscript from which this was translated. So how can they remove God when he appeared in the body? Something is seriously wrong there. So that's one of the, the uh, standards I use to determine if a Bible is trustworthy. The other one, of course, uh, is Acts 8.37. Acts 8.37, where we have the confession of the Ethiopian eunuch that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All right? That is a clear declaration of how to get saved. Then he said, okay, you believe that? You can get baptized. Well, in many of the modern translations, this entire verse has been omitted. And it says it's not found in the most ancient manuscripts. Wait a minute. This verse agrees with everything that we know about salvation. You confess your mouth and believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 9. How can they say it doesn't belong in the Bible? Something is seriously wrong. All right, so we find that we have some checks we can do to determine, and there are many, many more. We don't have time for that, but there are many others you can do to find out if the version that you're considering can replace your King James. I don't use the ESV either for that same reason. I think it was a, a substitute that was uh, given to fundamentalists, some fundamentalists, by Lucifer in the last 10, 15 years to get away from the truth of the King James Bible because it's more palatable to the modern culture. Folks, we stand on scripture, not on culture. You young man, I guess you're at Bible college? Stand on scripture, not on culture. If you stand on culture, you'll be constantly shifting. And in 20 years, you won't know what to believe. So stand on the verbally inspired, preserved word of God. Bear in mind that the so-called ancient manuscripts or authorities are invariably, without, without any shadow of a doubt, Without question, they're always based on the Alexandrian, Westcott, and Hort family of manuscripts. Every single time. And so, Bible authority, based upon the authority of God himself. When I obey my Bible, I'm obeying God himself. And I see the results. Be married to the same one for 41 and a half years, raised two lovely kids with her, and I've seen the importance of obeying the word of God, especially in the ministry. Doing what God says, even if it doesn't seem right to me. Even if what God says doesn't agree with my flesh. Many times what God says doesn't agree with what I want to do. But what God says takes preeminence over Tony Smart. Hopefully over you as well. Then, scripture commandments and principles are given to govern behavior. Govern behavior. We are to behave the way we believe. Not how we profess to believe, but how we truly believe. America is guilty of worshiping the idol of education. Secular education does not consider the Bible to be the word of God. Thus, they have removed God's authority from their kids to their own destruction, I must say. When you send your kid to a secular college and he or she comes back in three or four years and tells mom and dad, I don't believe what you believe anymore. As a matter I believe contrary to what you believe. You wonder what happened to them? They got brainwashed. They got indoctrinated by a disciple of Karl Marx and Frederick Hegel, and uh, Wesley and Hort, and others. Be careful which college you send your kids to when they come out of high school. 
The, the Bible is the supreme authority for faith and the practice of that faith. May I say that family problems, loneliness, illness, and even death are designed to soften people's hearts and turn them towards the word of God to receive comfort. So you're having problems? God is saying, read my word today. Pray, seek me. I have solution for you and comfort for you. And I always have a righteous solution for every problem. I always tell folks, no matter how bad it seems, God always has a righteous solution for every problem. Amen. Seek him. Then, preservation of scripture. Preservation of scripture. God inspired the Holy Scriptures and is fully capable of preserving them, as the brothers said before. He can preserve them all by himself. God in his wisdom and goodness will preserve his word because of five things. Number one, the Bible has all we know about salvation. Everything I know about being saved is found here in the book. That's a good reason to preserve it, isn't it? Number two, the source of all doctrine is the Bible. Amen. How can I pastor my church and teach people without a good source of doctrine? This is my wellspring. Number three, when Jesus stood up to read scripture in the synagogue, he read from preserved manuscripts. From Luke 4, 16 through 21. Don't turn it around, but later on, you can read it. God gave, this is number four, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses twice. The first time, he came down and saw the people having their party naked, worshiping the golden calf. He got angry, and he threw down the tablets of stone and broke them. So God says, Moses, you hot-headed. I'm going to give it to you a second time. Same words, all right, same exact words. Now you have the tables of stone. Put them in the ark. That's preservation, my friend, because God remembers what he said to you the first time. Amen. I mean, that's a good thing to know. What he said to me 20 years ago, he was not incoherent. And he meant what he said then, and he still means it today. So that keeps me on the right path keeps me from getting into big trouble with the wrong people. I get into trouble, but with people who are on the wrong side of the issues. And it's okay, because we are called to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. I'm a contender for the faith. I will discuss, dispute, and dialogue with anyone who wants honest dialogue and understanding of the Bible. Then, Number five, he preserves his words because he wants us to know his words. He wants you and me to know what he says and what he means. Now, there's a movement that started in the 20th century, about 30 years ago, called the Neo-Evangelical Movement. Neo-Evangelicals has done more damage to the concept of separation from error instead of collaborating with it. They have ruined the church's standard of separation. All those so-called Baptists who dropped their Baptist name to follow the culture, the lights, the mirror, the smoke, Brother Thursday, on their platform, they have succumbed to the neo-evangelical movement which does not believe in confronting error, but rather to agree with it, accept it. Let's all get along. No. That is not the speech of the scripture. We're told, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. So this movement has appealed to the carnal ones in the church, and they use Bibles that tend to agree with the Vaticanus family of manuscripts, which is the foundation of many of the modern translations. Check it out. 
You one of those churches when the preacher puts on his skinny jeans with his hose in it and gets out there to preach on a stool on Sunday morning, all right, after his praise theme, the little girl with the coochie coochie dresses, get down preaching, you'll find that this guy is going to open up a, a copy of the NIV or ESV or some other modern translation. He will not use the King James because the King James will rub him the wrong way. It is too dogmatic. He doesn't have that wiggle room to escape from standing for the things that are true, but rather he needs to go along with the culture because that's what's going to bring in the crowd, you see, to pay salary. Folks, if you're going to the ministry today, please don't go into the ministry to be popular. Go into the ministry to make a difference with Jesus Christ. Now, let me uh, wrap this up here this evening. This is a quote from Dr. E.F. Hills, who wrote the book, The King James Version Defended. The question was precisely which edition of received text should we follow? Here's what Dr. Hills answered in his book. He says, this is my answer to this problem. The text of the several editions of the Texas Receptus were God-guided. They were set up under the leading of God's special providence. Hence, differences between them were kept down to a minimum. But what do we, what do, we do in these few places in which the several editions of the Texas Receptus disagree with one another? Which text do we follow when they do disagree? The answer to this question is easy. He said, we were guided by the common fate, hence we favor that form of Textus Receptus upon which more than any other, God, working providentially, has placed the stamp of his approval, namely the King James Version, or more precisely, the Greek underlying the King James Version. He says God has placed his stamp of approval upon this Bible. That's the one you go with. So I would say to you in closing, brethren, ladies and gentlemen, disagree with Satan and disable his deception. Agree with him and collaborate with him. You can either be a person who disagrees with Satan and be an outcast from what he's doing and be right with God, or you can collaborate with him, be accepted, and be considered an apostate inside of God. Stick with the true preserved scripture of the King James Bible, and you will not go wrong. May God bless you and give you a wonderful evening.